Ambassador Froman and also Commissioner Durukt. Thank you very much. Less than a year ago today, the European Union and the United States, as we all know in this room, embarked upon the world's largest free trade agreement, one of the most ambitious plans to try and create more wealth between their respective economies and regions, more jobs and also more investment. We're here today to try and identify what's been achieved so far, what will be achieved in the future, and as Craig Kennedy was just saying before, we're delighted that these two gentlemen have decided to dedicate 40 minutes of their time, and for that reason, I'm going to get straight to it, and we're going to have to be brief. I will take about 10 minutes of questions towards the end. I will obviously encourage a number of our members of the audience to keep them brief so that we can get as many points of view across. Let me start out with you, Ambassador Froman. Um, obviously, these trade talks are taking place at a time of fears about a new Cold War. You're not just negotiating the TTIP here with Europe, you're also negotiating another free trade agreement with Pacific countries in the form of the TPP. And what's really crucial about those two agreements is that they don't include China and they don't include Russia. Isn't that risky these days? Well, I think, first of all, we have to look at the underlying motivations and drivers of these trade agreements. And I think of them really in three buckets. Uh, the most important one are the economic drivers. These trade agreements and negotiations have to stand on their own two feet and be justified uh, to our publics about how they create jobs, promote growth, strengthen the middle class in our respective economies. I think the second main driver of these trade agreements are what I'd call geoeconomics, which is strategic, but it's strategic in an economic sense that we want to work with like-minded parties to help set the rules of the game, uh, raise standards, uh, work together to, to, to uh, ensure that the global trading system is strong. And this is the case both with our TPP partners and, and clearly uh, with our, our European partners. And then the third main driver is strategic, is the geopolitical. And from our perspective, TPP is a key part of our rebalancing towards Asia agenda. And uh, TTIP is we're already building on a very strong economic relationship and it helps strengthen the overall transatlantic partnership that's so important across so many issues. But does that answer the question, though? Are we not risking alienating two of the world's superpowers at a time when we can't afford to? Well, we work, I, I won't speak for, for, for Carl, of course, but I think we all work very closely with China, Russia, Brazil, India, Indonesia, South Africa, um, a number of the other countries that are major economies in the world uh, on our bilateral issues and on other areas of cooperation, including in the trade area. With China, uh, for example, we have a series of bilateral dialogues that we are engaged in to address trade issues, and we're also in the midst of negotiating a bilateral uh, investment treaty that uh, will, we, we hope, uh, allow China to channel its commitment to reform its own economy and see how that's manifested through uh, an investment regime. Uh, and, with, and with Russia, prior to the recent developments, uh, we had a lot of discussion about resolving our bilateral economic uh, issues bilaterally through dialogue, but then, you know, where necessary, uh, you know, we're prepared to take countries to the WTO as well. Kjeldrut. It does seem slightly ironic to be here talking about free trade when sanctions are on the table further towards the east. What did you say? It does seem slightly ironic to be talking about free trade in one part of the world and to have sanctions imposed twice over the course of the last two weeks. Doesn't it? No. Okay. Is it not risky? Because... Uh Recently, uh, we are working a little bit less closely together with Russia. Is that uh, not risky? I don't know whether you have seen that, but... Uh, Is that not a risky strategy, to be embarking you know, uh, on such you, you know, strict we, trade we, ties uh, with other countries? The uh, United States and ourselves have been instrumental in getting Russia into the WTO. No? We were asked to do so, you know, by uh, uh, President Medvedev and, and the people around him. Uh, please make sure that we come into the WTO very soon. And we made a, a major effort, uh, and, and it's on the basis of our agreement that they have become a member of the WTO. Now, what I see is that since they are a member of the WTO, they do everything not to uh, live up to the agreements that they have been signing, even independently from what has happened now recently with Ukraine. You know, they, they simply don't live up to that. Uh, look at the recycling fee at, at the wood uh, uh, TRQs, and I could give you a, an endless. Uh, uh, row of, 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 of examples. So, uh, but we should also realize that apart from um, 
energy and a number of raw materials, Russia in itself is not a big trading partner, you know. If you take out of the Russian economy uh, the extractive part, uh, this is not a big economy. I mean, it's not the, the kind of economies that uh, United States or uh, Europe are. I mean, we are about the same. Huh? We are a little bit bigger than you, my family. Can I have it? Uh, <laughs> but we are. Huh? Uh, but uh, I mean, but you, when you compare that, uh, Russia, that's a very big trading partner, no? So uh, we also have a, a number of, of, of discussions with the, with the Chinese, uh, bilaterally, uh, uh, also on, on a number of, of uh, uh, TDI cases uh, recently, where we have tried to find a solution. Together we are involved in discussions uh, with them on, on, on subsidies, what should mm -hmm. happen on, in the future with respect to, uh, to subsidies. Uh, we have uh, very recently uh, started the negotiations on an investment agreement with China. You also have negotiations on the investment agreement uh, with China. So. They are an important partner and they are there to stay. I mean, uh, what, what we are asking them, and I think we have the same demand towards China, is get more involved and take more responsibility in the world trading system. Because you have now become a big economy. Uh, in a number of sectors, you are as mature as we are. So you should uh, engage more. And on the other hand, the discussions we have between us, uh, the United States and ourselves, um, I, I, I agree with, with what Mike has been saying on that, but if you look a little bit more at, in business terms, um, what we are looking for is what you call synergies, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit the same as, as we have in business, when you make uh, big conglomerates, you say, what could be the efficiency gains, you know? What can we gain by doing this? Well, there are a lot of efficient in, efficiency gains, gains between us if we manage to have a uh, the, the kind of TTIP agreement that, that, we have, uh, that we have on our mind. But it's also very strategic why well, the next big battle in trade is about norms, standards, regulations, disciplines, and, and there we should develop a common approach, and it's only by developing a common approach that we will be in a position to, uh, to, to uh, remain the, the, the driving force and, and also uh, the leading force in international trade. So that, that's, that's very strategic, obviously. I'd like to get, I'll, I'll get into the semantics of the deal that we're talking about, the TTIP, unfortunate acronym, as it might be, um, but I still I want to like just the acronym. home in. Oh. I like the acronym. <laughs> TTIP. Bob Zellick says an, uh, it's an unfortunate acronym, but uh, maybe maybe you're giving us a tip there. Um, I want to home in on the issue of sanctions for Russia, though, because this is a topical issue today. We've got the U.S. President Barack Obama in, arriving in town here in just a few days in Brussels. Sanctions for Russia. Is that the next so-called third stage? Could you ever envisage a trade war with Russia? You know, we, we sh we sh uh, let's try to have a, a very clear idea on what is happening with Russia pres presently. No? Um, what they are doing is, in fact, the annexation of the Crimea. That's what they are doing. You know? Now, that this is something that uh, is not normal. No, Indeed. It, so, mean, does it merit a trade war? No, it, 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 no, it, it doesn't have no, it, it doesn't have its place in normal international relations. Uh, and and uh, look from it, uh, look at it from from the north to the south. They have in Moldova, they have Transnistria. Uh, that's a, a black hole of smugglers, you know. Uh, among them, a number of Russian generals, by the way. Um, then you, you have in in, in Georgia. Uh, I'm saying this because I have been chairman in office of the OSCE. I mean, I know a little bit of these places. Huh? Uh, you have in Georgia, South Ossetia, and Abkhazia. South Ossetia, I mean, that's a real black hole. No, really? It's 40,000 inhabitants, and they make an independent state of it. What is this? Uh, and then they, uh, uh, they are using, um, uh, well, this, this conflict... Uh, um, with, with Georgia to uh, do the same with Abkhazia. They have also uh, annexed it. They, they are now doing the same in, in the Crimea, uh, obviously so. And, and uh, uh, they have also uh, forced Armenia not to uh, have an, uh, 
uh, association agreement with us uh, because uh, saying, look, uh, if you do that, then uh, we are not protecting you anymore with respect to Nugano Karabakh. So they, they are creating a kind of, of uh, a line of pearls, but they are, the pearls are, are uh, in fact frozen conflicts uh, at, at their borders. What's the sense of that, you know? Do we have to swallow that? No, I think that there is a price for that, and, and I think we should be very clear, the United States and you together, that they simply cannot do this, you know? So is that price trade? Well, at present, there are a number of, of decisions that have been taken with respect to uh, visa bans and, and asset freezes, no? Uh, and uh, we, we look at, at what the European Council has been saying, we are actively preparing economic sanctions if need be. And that's also the approach by the United States, and rightly so. How far would the United States economic sanctions go? Well, I think the, the key thing is to focus on uh, Russia's behavior. And it's Russia's actions that are increasingly isolated them in the international community. And they're actions that need to be answered. And the US and, and the EU and others um, are working together to uh, ensure an effective response. And we each are uh, approaching that and, and going through the analysis of it, um, while at the same time uh, in trying to work to resolve the overall issue. But uh, it's important that the countries come together and ensure that this kind of action um, is answered and that there is a, uh, a concerted response. Now, I may be ext overextending my brief here and asking you this, because I re recognize you're not the US Energy Secretary, although I put this question to him as well. Um, trade in energy towards Europe to unhook our dependence from Russian gas, something that could end up on your desk one day? Well, in our system, uh, the Department of Energy um, uh, issues licenses to companies who want to export. And if you're a free trade agreement country, uh, and that's one of the countries that they want to export, those licenses are deemed to be in the public interest. And if you're not, then there's another process. And we've approved a number of licenses for non free trade agreement countries. And those licensees actually have partnerships with a number of European uh, energy companies, uh, whether it's uh, Total or uh, BG or BP or, or others. And so by the licenses already approved, there's the potential for gas to be exported uh, to, uh, uh, to Europe, but it's very much up to the companies to decide where they're gonna take the gas. Clearly, uh, completing TTIP and having the EU in the category of free trade agreement countries uh, puts them uh, in that other category of licensees. Has this formed part of your discussion so far? Well, it's just a fact, it's an underlying fact of our, of our, of our Natural Gas Act and of our law. And so I think it's, uh, it's been, I've seen it discussed very much in the public and I think it's just yet another rationale for completing TTIP. Let's talk about TTIP, which is what we're also here to talk about today. What are you hoping to achieve from it? I'm going to ask one of you at a time, and I would beg you, gentlemen, to be as brief and candid as possible, to not say that you agree with everything here without putting it down in writing. Mr. De But before we started the before we started the negotiations, we had a high-level working group, and I think that last year, by the way, we discussed it here, uh, and. Uh, that's uh, the line that we are following. I mean, this deal makes a lot of sense, provided it's ambitious. I think it makes no sense when it's not ambitious. Because uh, we have already now the highway of trade between us, uh, two, more than two billion on a, on a daily basis. So if we want uh, uh, to find this, uh, solutions that are win-win situations, then we have to move into a higher gear with respect to tariffs, but also with respect to uh, to the services markets, to the public procurement markets, the, the investment and the regulatory. What is, what is really the most uh, novel uh, part of the agreement is the regulatory, but it will also be the most difficult one, huh? because uh, normally when you make a, a, a regulation, you've, it's because you're of the opinion that it's the best one. Huh? And sometimes we will have to, to, uh, uh, ch uh, to choose other approaches for, for, for the future, so that will be difficult. But. Uh, I have always said from the start that I think that the only way to make this deal is uh, when there is enough political steer. This is not a deal like another one, uh, because all what they call the low-hanging fruit, I mean, is already in the basket, you know, that, that we have that. So you need a lot of political steer, and my approach as politician is that if you need political steering, then you should try to do it in as short, in a short as possible a period. I mean, you cannot... Uh, 
keep the momentum, uh, political momentum for years and years and years on. So I think we should try to do it. Uh, as as uh, uh, Mike has once said, uh, one tank of gas, but of course the price of gas has gone drastically down in the, in the United States. Huh? Uh, but that, that's what we should do. I mean, it's about uh, taking a number of political decisions. Well, speaking of the political will to get anything through, we should also talk about the TPA in the United States. It's unlikely that that is going to get passed before midterms, before Congress sets again. When do you think it will get passed and how will that affect your f timing framework? Because Europe committed, it seemed, to one time frame, but the United States never did. Well, I don't think uh, it affects uh, the TTIP negotiations um, and the timing of those negotiations at all. We're working in parallel uh, to make progress and to uh, push these negotiations as far and as fast as we can. And as Carl said, it's got to be an ambitious, comprehensive, high standard agreement, including, uh, uh, according to the high-level working group, the goal should be the full elimination of tariffs. We want to get rid of non-tariff barriers. We want to see if we can bridge the divergences in our regulatory systems and in our approach to standards while absolutely maintaining the level of health, safety, and environmental protection that our regulators think is appropriate and our people have come to expect. And so we have a lot of work to do, but we're working very hard at it and we hope to, to expedite that work. Trade Promotion Authority, it's a legislative process. We have our domestic process. Europe has its own approval processes. Uh, there's now a discussion in the Congress and in the, in the public in the United States about it. We have a new chairman of the Finance Committee who's going to take some time to work with the Democrats and Republicans on his committee, work with people in the House as well. And we're um, eager to work with them in parallel as we work in these negotiations. Is America really behind the TTIP? It's people? Well, I, I, the, uh, the, uh, if you took a poll of the American people on TTIP, and I've seen some recent polls, um, they're really quite positive, yes. I mean, it's not a great deal of, of knowledge about the word TTIP in the American public, but I think if you ask people, would you like to expand trade uh, uh, with Europe, if you'd like to uh, negotiate an agreement to expand trade with Europe, I think you find that there's quite a bit of support, and I imagine you'll be able to find polls out there uh, that show that. Um, what's important, as Carl says, is that there be strong political impetus behind that. And uh, when our leaders came together last year, uh, President Obama, President Von Rompuy, and President Barroso, to launch TTIP, they made clear they wanted this to be that once-in-a-generation type agreement that can really move the needle in a, what's already a deep and broad economic relationship. Carl, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult enough for the Obama administration to get it through the American political system. We have 28 countries here in the European Union. Um, we've got pages and pages of debates about whether a Jaffa cake is a biscuit or not and whether one country can sell Tokai or another. It's going to be really difficult to get the minutiae of this through. You know, I have come over the last years to the conclusion that we have both a very difficult political system, both of us. Well, mm. Indeed. And that's uh, what has once been said uh, by Kissinger. Huh? Uh, when I, uh, I have to phone to Europe, I don't know what telephone uh, number I have to take. That goes for the United States as well, you know. Uh, it's, you know, we have in Europe, and uh, we have the idea that, that the United States is it's much more integrated than we are. Uh, because you have a president and an army, you know, and we don't have that. Huh? Uh, but when you look a little bit under the surface, this is as complicated a system as we are. For example, we have always TPA. F fast track, we always have it. No? We, we are in, 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 uh, on the basis of the, the Treaty of Lisbon, the European Parliament uh, can say yes or no. It's a ratification procedure, it's not a legislative procedure. In the United States, you need TPA, and of course, when they give you TPA, the, the Congress, they will want to know more or less what you're going to do. I mean, probably, huh? I can imagine. Huh? Um, the same with uh, the line ministries. Huh? Uh, of course, you have, uh, in the United States, I have to, to uh, consult with the line ministries, and I have to consult with the other DGs in the European Commission and with the member states. So it's, it's not much different. Um, it all comes down whether, to whether or not um, the climate is um, set to make trade agreements. 
and if it's against state agreements, then you will send that in, in the member states, you will send that in the commission, you will send that in the Congress, you will... S it, it's like that. And so that's why I believe that you need the necessary political impetus, but it should not necessarily be more difficult with uh, the, the 28 member states, because in the end, uh, what you need is an agreement in the council, uh, where the 28 member states are, and you could uh, compare that more or less with the Senate. Huh? Uh, and uh, you need an agreement in the European Parliament by ratification procedure, and that, that's, that's your Congress. So that it's, it's more or less the same. And of course, we've got the elections going on there as well. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, if, imagine that the deal were, were ready now and you had to present it to the European Parliament, that you would get it through. Uh, don't ask me what happens after the elections because I don't know what the composition of the European Parliament will be. But in, it's in the end the European Parliament that will have to agree, you know. But I will ask you this. We won't be in crisis mode in a year and a half's time. Will that sap the impetus for trying to strike this trade agreement? Because this was born at a time when Europe was weak, economically speaking. But within a year we will not be uh, facing uh, excessive growth either, you know. So, uh, I know I'm, I'm... I can quote I'm, you on that, no, then. I'm, I'm, blood, I'm bloody <laughs> serious about that. Look at, look at the period before 2008. Huh? We had um, a, a medium-term growth uh, of about 2%, no? In Europe, I mean. Huh? Um, and the United States a little bit higher, but partly in the US and in the EU on the basis of, of a number of uh, um, well miscalculations, for example, with respect to... Uh, um, um, real estate and, and so on, no, with, with a lot of, uh, how would I say, artificial input in the economic system that we will not have in the coming years because we are now very afraid of doing that. Now, tell me, unless we take other initiatives, how we are going to get back to uh, sustained growth, you know, we will have to do something that, that makes sense economically by, by having a lot of, of synergies between us, having new developments, uh, having a leading role on the international scene. So that's why we need the agreement. That's not going to disappear next year or, or in two years or in three years, no? Ambassador Froman, we should talk about uh, other stakeholders who will be affected by this TTIP agreement, notably the private sector, and obviously the lobbying force in America is legendary. Um, what has the private sector been telling you, and is there a risk here? Because certainly in the United Kingdom, where I come from, there's a feeling that there's a risk that those negotiating the deal are being lobbied very hard for what industry wants. Well, we have a wide range of stakeholders who express their view to us. Um, certainly there are business interests that do, but uh, there are labor interests, there are uh, consumer groups, environmental groups, <coughs> excuse me, um, a whole array of NGOs who are involved. We have a whole process uh, bringing them in and giving us advice. Uh, for example, we have a, a, a committee that has all the labor union presidents as part of that that gives us advice. We've created a new committee on public interest groups that will include uh, consumer groups, uh, groups uh, interested in development, they help us with our trade policy towards developing countries, uh, uh, groups interested in public health. So we take a wide range of input. And of course, we work extremely closely, and each of our systems is a little different, obviously. We work extremely closely with Congress before and during and of course after the negotiations. So for example, uh, every proposal that we table at the negotiation, we preview with our committees of jurisdiction or the relevant committees. And on TPP, which is further along than, than TTIP, on TPP, we've had more than 1,200 briefings in Congress on TPP alone. So we take, and that's an opportunity for us to get input from Congress and, and for them to provide input that they're hearing from stakeholders too. In our negotiations, and we started this in TPP, we're doing it in TTIP now too. At our rounds of negotiations, we organize sessions for stakeholders to come and present, and we get hundreds of them who come and present their views directly to, to, to negotiators from, from both sides. So we, we think it's absolutely critically important that we get that kind of public input into our negotiations. It makes for a better agreement. And indeed, uh, Commissioner Hook, you've actually been on a bit of a charm offensive in the southern states of the United States, trying to speak to farmers over there, haven't you? What, was, what kind of concerns did they have about merging America and Europe's agriculture businesses, that the whole framework, what kind of concerns did they have about that? I would not be reasoning in terms of a merger, no. honestly speaking. <laughs> um, 
the framework. Uh, I don't know whether it was a charm offensive either, but for me it was interesting that to to uh, to know something more about it. I mean, when you uh, make a couple of, of uh, uh, speeches and you you speak to the uh, the people um, on the ground, uh, it it, uh, it it learns you a lot on what is, in fact, the policy space you have to come to an agreement. I was recently in, in Georgia, um, and um, um, I was asking myself, why did they uh, jump out of the GPA? And because uh, you remember them when they had the GPA, the government procurement agreement negotiations, uh, at the very end, uh, Georgia, that jumped out. What was the reason for that? And uh, I have had some discussions there also with uh, um, political uh, figures and, and the, the business community, and it learns you something, because it's important when you negotiate that you have an, a physical idea of what you are really talking about. You know, not only about papers, but what are you really talking about? What is what is feasible? What is not feasible? So, and and, and if between now and the end of the year I have time to go to some other uh, places in the US, I, I will try to do so. Uh, not in terms of. of um, I mean, it's not me who is going to, the, to convince them that they should do it differently. I mean, that, that's up to the, to the uh, uh, United States uh, politicians, uh, to, to Mike Froman to do so. It's not uh, Mike Froman who is going to convince the uh, uh, European constituencies either. But you learn something when speaking to them, yes? Let me start taking a few questions. Um, obviously, I'd like to remind our... People who are, who are asking questions to identify themselves, but also to be brief and no statements, please, because we're really running against time. Take one in the second row. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Turkish Business and Industry Association. My question is, I know, we know that there are lots of tangible issues on your negotiation table, uh, very technical issues, but in designing this vision uh, for the trans future transatlantic market, there was, as an idea, a concept in the air, the, uh, the innovation union. So the innovation union, so what's happening with that? Is substantially, is it still part of the vision? Well, uh, I think one of the main drivers of this initiative has been to help take steps that would improve the competitiveness and the innovation of both our economies. And we have a lot of interaction back and forth, including about how to ensure that new technologies, the digital economy is very much part of the trading system as we move forward. So yes, I think both of us are quite focused on building innovation societies. We both have innovative economies, and we want to make sure that that's reflected and further through this trade agreement. Can I just, I'll take one question here from the gentleman in front, who I believe is also Turkish. Okay, uh, yes. Ilter Turan from Istanbul Bilgi University. Uh, obviously, the United States has EFTA, and uh, the European Union has some complicated relationships, like a customs union with Turkey. How is this going to fit into the system you have in mind? We have an, uh, a customs union with uh, Turkey uh, for goods. No? Um, so it's limited to goods and uh, including agricultural products with, with a number of, of uh, reservations. So, um, and uh, understandably, the, uh, uh, the Turkish are, are asking us, and what about us when we, you make that kind of agreement with the US? Um, that's not only with uh, this agreement, but also with other free trade agreements. And uh, what we want uh, our uh, partners to do, in this case the United States, is that they would have the same kind of free trade agreement with, uh, uh, with Turkey. Um, and we're also ready to uh, have uh, closer cooperation with, with Turkey on this. I was two weeks ago in, in, uh, uh, in Istanbul to uh, discuss with my... Uh, uh, Turkish uh, counterpart, we also decided on a number of uh, upgradings we could do with respect to the customs union. So th this is a real problem, uh, I, I'm not denying it, but on the other hand, uh, even without changing the present agreements, uh, uh, Turkey would take profit of this uh, TTIP agreement, they would not be paying for it, you know, that that's, I think is not, that is not right, but uh, uh, we are in close cooperation with them, in collaboration with them to see how uh, best to uh, uh, fit this into the TTIP agreement. Oh, right, so we've had two questions on Turkey. I'll take actually a couple of questions at once because we're running against the gun. 
Anton? Thank you, Anton Laguardia from The Economist. I'd like to know how the crisis in Ukraine is affecting the climate of the negotiations, whether it speeds them up or slows them down. And secondly, I'd like to know uh, when the tank of gas runs out. Right, let's take another question that was very pertinent considering as our original discussion. Yes, is that Liam Fox? I see it at the back. <laughs> Hi, Liam Fox, uh, Member of Parliament in the UK. Uh, the potential for TTIP is enormous and we all wish you well, but how do you take two very different economic models and, and, and make them compatible? Because the EU is a market of harmonisation underpinned by the ACI. The United States economy is much more open, deregulated and far closer to a market of mutual recognition. As they say, a bird may love a fish, but where will they build a home together? Right. Well... I'll take a shall brief, I, shall brief I, answer uh, shall I start quickly with for the that last one. I, I know, of course, you're going to mention shall the shall UK. Shall I start with the last question, uh, um. sir? Uh, the internal market in Europe is not based on harmonization. It's completely based on mutual recognition. Uh, because the internal market uh, is the result of a number of decisions by the European Court of Justice. Uh, and the, the, the golden rule is that is, is something is allowed in one member it should be allowed in the rest of the European Union as well. So we have tried for decades to, to make an internal market on the basis of harmonization and it never worked, you know. And that's why we turned to the mutual recognition. So there I cannot agree with you. Now, the second question of uh, um, the very respected journalist here, I, I didn't rightly understand. We'll, we'll, we'll tackle that one in a second, but I just want to get um, Ambassador Froman's view on that. The European Union has its own political forces pulling in different directions, national forces, etc. Um, does that ever make you negotiating these trade agreements blink and think? <laughs> I'm hopefully thinking all the time. Um, you know, but look, blink. as, as, as Carl said, uh, uh, we each have our complications in, in our systems. Um, but I think we also each see the underlying logic of this overall initiative. And it's not that we're, going to, that we're not going to convert the EU to become the United States, and the EU is not going to convert uh, the United States to become the EU. But there are barriers that we can eliminate. There are areas where we can cooperate. There are mechanisms for ensuring that where uh, there are divergences in how we approach issues, that we can try and bridge those divergences, provided we don't lower the overall standards. And that's exactly the hard work that we're, we're very much getting at. Right, let's ask you that question about Ukraine. This goes back to what I was tackling at the beginning of our discussions. Um, how have the situation, how have these trade sanctions, the situation in Ukraine, what's gone on in the last week, how has that influenced the talks that you've been having? Um, to my mind, not at all. Because, I mean, uh, why would we change our positions in negotiations because of what's happened in, in Ukraine? And because we, we have the same analysis of what is happening there, no? Namely that it's uh, in, international, in international law completely unacceptable. And that uh, uh, we, um, okay, we have to, to live with this, but we will do it in a way that uh, life doesn't become easier for Russia. No? But does, does it mean that you should have is it imperative now that the United States and the European Union have stronger ties? Or does it send the signal towards the East that they are excluded? And one of, of the, uh, the arguments that is then being put forward is about energy. Now, it's obvious that it's in uh, both our interests of Europe, of course, but also of the United States, that Europe becomes more independent with respect to energy. That, that's, I mean, that's a fact of life. Now, uh, uh, that's why I think we should have an ambitious uh, uh, chapter on, on, on energy in, in, in the TTIP uh, uh, agreement. But, um, um, but Michael already mentioned this you know, with, with respect to, to, uh, to shale gas. Um, we have, uh, for minerals in, and, and for extraction industry in general, already for years the same approach. Uh, we we uh, recently have had uh, two cases together 
before the WTO on on, uh, on minerals and then on, on rare earth minerals, where we had the same approach, namely that uh, one should have free access to the minerals wherever they are digged out of the soil. No, so that we, we have no different approach on on on, on energy either. Uh, of course, the energy, uh, the, the new discoveries are in the United States and much less here. So why would this influence the whole environment? I don't believe so. It, it's again, uh, I believe, a, a, a very clear uh, token that, uh, uh, well, friends have to work together because uh, obviously Russia is not a friend of ours for the time being, no? We've got to wrap things up in a second, but I just want to ask one final question to Ambassador Roman. The TTIP, the TPP, you've got all these bilateral and various multilateral trade deals going on in the United States. Do they work with the WTO or do we have this parallel system that seems to be springing up? Well, I don't think they're mutually exclusive and, and it's a very good question you raise because we've also been working very hard in the WTO together uh, with our European colleagues to complete the first agreement, the first multilateral agreement the WTO ever completed in Bali in December on trade facilitation, a very important agreement, as well on some other issues. Uh, but we also have a, a negotiations uh, underway at the WTO uh, on information technology projects, uh, products, on environmental goods, uh, and on services. And so we believe very strongly in the multilateral system, and we believe that through these uh, initiatives, if we can raise the standards overall, in the global trading system. If we can introduce new disciplines that more and more countries sign on to and are comfortable with it, it makes it all the easier to strengthen the multilateral system on that basis as well. And I think a lot of the work that uh, each of us have been doing in our respective uh, trade policies has helped give dynamism to the multilateral trading system at the same time. Before we go, any concerns about the fallout surrounding the NSA? It must be quite difficult negotiating a trade pact if you're contending with accusations of one party spying on another. Is that a question for me it or is for a question, Carl? Well, oh, it's a question okay. for you. <laughs> you know, look, I, this is obviously a very uh, serious issue and we've got officials from both sides uh, who are talking through those issues. Um, and I think that uh, they raise you know, very, very, uh, very serious concerns that we're going to have to be dealt with. I think at the same time, uh, the European leaders and the Commission uh, as well has uh, made clear that it wants to continue the TTIP negotiations uh, in parallel. And we've continued to do that even as this other dialogue is going on among the relevant officials. In a transparent manner. <laughs> right. The transparent TTIP. On that note, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my guests, Ambassador Mike Froman. Thank you very much, US That's Trade Representative, and Karen de Hoogt, who is, of course, the Commissioner for Trade for the European Union. As we promised, these two gentlemen have actually given us five minutes more than they had dedicated in their bilateral negotiations. We will look forward to the Brussels Forum Accord, I suppose. Um, we'd love to see you sign something with the name of Brussels Forum on it. If you could ink the paper, we'd all go home and sleep a little bit easier with a lot more trade under our belt. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much.